Hi guys, a very warm welcome to the channel. In this video, we're gonna go super deep into the Barry Harris Sixth Diminish concept and how we can use the amazing possibilities it gives us within our improvising. So stick around. So Barry Harris is this incredible jazz pianist and educator who's famous for sharing his knowledge on the bebop tradition as well as his own approach to viewing the language of music as a whole. There's a ton of stuff of him online which is all worth checking out, but one of the things he's probably most well known for is his sixth diminished scale. So if you've clicked on this video, you've probably already checked out this concept and have a pretty good idea of what it is. But my aim for this lesson is to teach it from the ground up so that you have the fundamentals of what this concept is, where it came from, and how to develop and apply it so that you've got everything you need to know to start on a lifetime of exploring this beautiful sound. So let's get straight into it. The sixth diminished concept is all about seeing relationships between chords and creating harmonic and melodic movement when supporting a melody or playing through chord changes. Barry often refers to the modern day jazz student or musician as being two five players, meaning that we tend to see chord changes as separate blocks which we read from a page, as opposed to seeing the relationships within a chord and the possible inner movements. So let's first look at what the major sixth diminished scale is. It's basically a major scale with an added flat six or sharp five interval, making it an eight note scale. So in the key of C, the notes would be C, D, E, F, G, A flat, A and B. You might already be familiar with this set of notes if you've ever checked out any of the bebop scale concepts, as this is the same set of intervals which make up a major bebop scale. However, even though both scales share the same notes, you don't really want to think of the major sixth diminished scale as the same as the major bebop scale, just because the bebop scale concept is purely about adding that A flat to act just as a chromatic passing tone in order to make the chord tones land on the downbeats. Whereas in the sixth diminished scale, the A flat is an essential note which makes up the core sound of the scale when harmonized. So even though both concepts share the same scale, they are not the same purely because their functions are different. Another way of viewing this scale is by seeing it as being made up by a major sixth chord and a diminished chord. This is because when harmonizing the scale by stacking thirds to generate four note chords, or by Barry's definition of constructing a chord, skip a note, skip a note, skip a note within the notes of the scale. If we do this, all we get is a C major sixth and a D diminished chord, which alternate between their inversions. So if you harmonize each note of the scale, you would get the four inversions of C six and then also the four inversions of D diminished, which is the equivalent of an F diminished, uh, A flat diminished and B diminished, as they all share the exact same notes. So for the purpose of this lesson, let's view the scale as being made up of a major sixth chord and a diminished chord built from the major seventh degree of the scale. So C six and B diminished. This also allows us to now see the diminished chord as being built from the third of the dominant of C. The dominant of C is the fifth, which is G, and so the diminished chord is built from the B or third of G. So this also now tells us that when playing this harmonized scale, it is technically cycling through a 5-1 cadence because building a diminished chord off the third of a dominant gives you a dominant flat 9 chord. So what we are also getting is a repeating C6 and G7 flat 9 chord sequence as we go through the harmonized scale, hence why the sound of each diminished inversion is wanting to resolve to the next C6 inversion. However, this concept really goes so much deeper than just this. So before we go any further, I'm going to show you our go-to voicings for this scale as chords. So as well as learning it in closed position, Barry also applies the drop voicing system to these four note chords. And this is actually really good for guitar because playing these chords in closed position can be really hard or even close to impossible for certain inversions on certain string sets, whereas the drop voicings work really well on guitar. I'll be doing a really in-depth lesson on my view of the drop system, but for now, all you need to know is that drop just means to lower a note down an octave. And in this system, we think of all four notes in numbers. So the highest note is one and the lowest note is four. So if we had a drop two, we would drop the second note from the top down an octave. This makes the chord more of an open sound as well as making it less of a stretch on the guitar. We also want to know drop threes, which applies the same principle, but now we lower the third note from the top instead, which creates even more of a spread voicing and an open sound. The other one which I'll show you is the drop two and four. This is where we drop more than one note, the second note from the top and the bottom note. There are others too, such as the drop two and three or the double drop two, drop three, but we won't get into those for this video. So here's what the major sixth diminished scale is chords sound like on the guitar in drop two. We can also play the drop twos on the middle four strings as well. Mm -hmm. 
and also on the top four strings. We can only do the other drop voicings on the lowest four strings or the middle four strings. So here's drop three. And then drop two and four. So you can hear that already there's some really lovely sounding movement going on just by playing through the scale as chords. Here's an important bit of terminology to know. Barry refers to the four notes of the chord as being the soprano, alto, tenor and bass. Soprano being the highest note, alto being the second highest, tenor being the third and bass being on the bottom. If we take a drop 3, C6 in first inversion, now the soprano is the note A, G is the alto, C is the tenor and E is in the bass. It is a shame that not all of these chords voiced in closed position are possible on the guitar. However, if you want to get closer to the sound of playing those closed position voicings, but without having the big stretches, then what we can do is leave out one of the notes. Get rid of either the soprano or the bass voice, so that we're left with three consecutive notes. So, if we do that with this voicing, a closed position C6 in second inversion, which actually isn't too bad of a stretch compared to some of the others. But yeah, if we get rid of the bass note, we're left with these three consecutive notes, which can really be quite comfortably taken through the scale. Some of these voicings actually sound really great, and it's going to allow for so much more speed and control when playing ideas as opposed to using the full four note chord. This is definitely something any instrument should experiment with. We can also now try and open up these three consecutive notes by moving the middle note up or down an octave. So if we take our starting three note voicing, which was A, C and E, and drop the C down an octave, we now have C, A and E. Now if we take that through the scale, we get this. If you know your shell voicings, or have ever checked out some of the Gypsy Jazz guitar language, then you probably recognise these voicings, but Barry will say that this is where those movements come from. As well as the major sixth diminished scale, there are three more scales in this concept which we need to know. The minor sixth diminished, the dominant seven diminished, and the dominant seven flat five diminished. All four scales use the exact same theory of being constructed by the chord mentioned in the scale's name, and a diminished chord built from the scale's major seventh degree. So a C minor sixth diminished scale would be a C minor sixth chord paired with a B diminished chord, giving the notes uh, C, D, E flat, F, G, A flat, A and B. A C dominant diminished scale would be a C7 paired with a B diminished, so C, D, E, F, G, A flat, B flat, and B. For a dominant 7 flat 5 diminished, again it's now a C7 flat 5 chord paired with a B diminished, giving the notes C, D, E, F, G flat, A flat, B flat, and B. Make sure to also get familiar with all of these scales as chords using all of those voicing options which I showed you earlier. So now, before we go further into the applications of these scales, let's get into how Barry came up with this diminished theory. This concept has actually been around for a long time as it's been a common arranging technique used for early big band writing. However, Barry discovered it from a completely different angle um, and categorized it, gave it names, and has been developing the endless possibilities ever since. So Barry has quite a unique perspective on the theoretical side of music, which you won't find being taught at any music school. He takes quite a spiritual approach, starting with the 12 notes of the chromatic scale. Now, these are all the notes in our Western music, and he refers to this as being our musical universe, or the 12 disciples, or the 12 zodiac signs, or the 12 months of the year. But basically, he refers to these 12 notes as being God. He then goes on to say that God then made man and woman, or Adam and Eve, which he refers to as being the two whole tone scales. So, one starting on C, which gives you the notes C, D, E, G flat, A flat, and B flat, and then one starting on the note D flat, giving you the rest of the possible notes in our universe. So, D flat, E flat, F, G, A, and B. So, what then happened next? The man and woman had children. They had three children, which Barry refers to as the three possible diminished chords available to us in our musical universe C diminished, D flat diminished, and D diminished. Um, each of these three diminished chords, as Barry puts it, all share a 50-50 split of DNA or chromosomes from the two whole tone scales. Because if you take a C diminished chord, you get the notes C, E flat, G flat, and A, and two of those notes, C and G flat, come from the first parent, the C whole tone scale, and the other two notes, E flat and A, come from the second parent, the D flat whole tone scale. You'll find that this is the same for also the D flat diminished and D diminished. 
So by changing a couple of notes, you can get to any diminished chord from either one of the whole tone scales, which is already giving us some options to create harmonic movement with. This way of thinking is all very logical and it's a really elegant way to see these relationships, but here it is with a more mathematical view. So if 12 is all our notes, the chromatic scale or God, if we divide that by six, we get two six note scales, the two whole tone scales or man and woman. Divide 12 by four and we get the three four note diminished chords, the children. We can also continue this by dividing 12 by three, which will give us the four augmented triads. And finally, if we divide 12 by two, we get the six possible tritones. So what we then do next in order to get all the other chords which are used in what Berry calls the diminished family is we move certain diminished chord tones around. So if we take a C diminished, which we know is the exact same as an E flat diminished, G flat diminished and A diminished, but if we lower one of the chord tones, we get a dominant seventh chord. We can do this to any of the chord tones, which will result into four different dominant seventh chords, uh, B7, D7, F7 and A flat seven. This is also a way to see where the eight note whole half or half whole diminished scale comes from, because if you put together the four related dominant roots, which are below each diminished chord tone, they make up another diminished chord, which is a semitone below the original diminished chord. Put the notes of these two diminished chords together and they make up the eight note diminished scale. And because these four dominant chords are all related to each other, as they all come from this one diminished chord, they all work and play well together. So we can stack any of these chords or triads over each other and it will bring out different tensions all found within the half whole diminished scale. So this is a very common bit of knowledge as most people know that a diminished chord is the same as a dominant flat nine chord. And so by lowering one of the chord tones, it replaces the flat nine with the dominance root, creating just a regular four note dominant seventh chord. But what isn't as common knowledge is that we can also raise each chord tone up a half step. So if we raise one of the diminished chord tones, we now get a minus sixth chord. And again, we can do this to any of the diminished chord tones, which will result in giving us four different minus sixth chords. So G flat minus six, A minus six, C minus six, and E flat minus six. So what else can we do? Now let's lower two consecutive notes down a half step. Consecutive meaning two notes closest together in a closed position chord. So for C diminished, C and E flat are consecutive, E flat and G flat are consecutive, G flat and A are consecutive, and A and C are actually consecutive as well. So if we lower two of these consecutive notes, we now get a major sixth chord. And because there are four possible consecutive notes which we can move, we get four different major sixth chords, D6, F6, A flat six, and B6. So now let's move these consecutive chord tones up. This is actually gonna give us a whole other set of different major sixth chords, but which are still within this family. So A6, C6, E flat six, and G flat six. So the last thing we can now try is moving two non-consecutive notes. We only get two non-consecutive note options, which are C and G flat, and then E flat and A. So if we lower the C and G flat, we get a B7 flat five chord, which is also the exact same as an F7 flat five chord, as they're just an inversion of one another. This is because dominant flat five chords are tritone apart, share the exact same notes. If we lower the E flat and A, we get a D7 flat five or an A flat seven flat five. If we go back and now raise the non-consecutive notes, we get an A7 flat five or E flat seven flat five, and a C7 flat five or a G flat seven flat five. So to summarize, within this one diminished family, we get C diminished, and of course all four of its inversions, we get four dominant seventh chords, four minor sixth chords, four major sixth chords, another set of four different major sixth chords, and four different dominant flat five chords, plus the other four dominant flat five chords, which are just the inversions of the previous ones. Uh, this also tells us why there are four scales, major sixth, minor sixth, dominant seven, and dominant seven flat five diminished. So this is a big family of chords which all share and come from this one C diminished, and so they are all related to one another. Within each chord quality, the chords are a minor third apart, and Barry calls these minor third relationships brothers and sisters. And what he likes to say is, who do children play well with first? Their brother and their sister, referencing that all these chords work well together to create movement. <laughs> A common sound that Berry uses to demonstrate connecting these relationships is by moving from a C6 chord to an F6 chord with a C diminished in between. Really this is just a movement in F major because C6 can be used as a voicing for F as C6 over F is basically an F major 9 chord which is basically just an F6 with borrowed notes. But I'll get deeper into that later when we talk about some of the 6th chord options available to us and the borrowing concept. So in drop 2 it sounds like this. So that's C6 to C diminished, moving to F6. This also sounds great when we take it through their inversions as well. Mm -hmm. 
This move also exists for the brothers and sisters of minor third apart too. So E flat to A flat, uh, G flat to B, or A to D. They are all using the same C diminished chord to connect to one another. And so connecting any combination of these chords using that diminished in between will work really nicely. For example, connecting E flat to B. This works because all these major sixth chords come from the same diminished by either raising or lowering two consecutive notes, hence why they all share the same diminished chord. We can also do a similar move by moving from the four chord to the F with a diminished in between. So B flat six to B diminished moving to F six. That sounds like this. And if we take it through its inversions, So this time the diminished which B flat 6 and F6 come from is the D diminished. Here's another cool thing to spot. Let's look at the C6 to F6 again, but this time see C6 as the 1 chord. So this move is now using the 1 diminished to get from the 1 chord to the 4 chord, but F6 contains the same notes as a D minor 7, which in relation to C is also the 2 chord. You could also see the 1 diminished as the same as the flat 3 diminished, and now say that we're going from the 1 and then using the flat 3 diminished to resolve to the 2, and then back to flat 3 diminished to resolve to the 1 again. So. A well known Berry quote is when he says, Why doesn't anybody play flat 3 diminished anymore? What he might mean by this is that in jazz we're so used to playing our 2 5 1s and using the dominant 5 chord as our movement to 1 that we forget about using the versatile flat 3 diminished, which can resolve to either the 1 chord or the 2 chord. Uh, it can even resolve to the 3 chord, E minor 7, which is typically a sub for the 1 chord anyway, because E minor 7 is actually a G6 and G6 over C is C major 9. Again, this will make more sense later on, but anyway, we've managed to move from the 1 chord to the 2 chord and back without ever needing to play a dominant 5 chord. So you can apply this tension and release movement without being boxed in by the 2-5-1 terminology. For example, here's some movement from chord to chord without even using the dominant 5 chord, but instead thinking in diminished instead. The reason we can lower and raise different diminished notes around to generate the families of those four different chord types is because we're borrowing and mixing notes from two different diminished chords. So if we look at C6, we got there by raising two consecutive notes up from a C diminished. So this C6 chord now shares 50% of its DNA from the C diminished, the C in A notes, and the other 50% comes from the D flat diminished. Uh, so the E and G notes. So now we know this C6 is made up of two different diminished chords. But what about the other diminished, the one we haven't used, the D diminished? We haven't yet included this one, so what we do is add it by putting the D diminished together with the C6. This is what creates the C major 6th diminished scale and answers why we play through and move from C6 to D diminished. We can experiment with this on the other chord types too. Let's take C7. One of the notes, the C, is from the C diminished, and the other three notes come from the D flat diminished, so we include the D diminished. C minor 6, three notes now come from the C diminished, and one note comes from the D flat diminished, so again, we would add the D diminished. The C7 flat 5, that has two notes from the C diminished and two notes from the D flat diminished, so we add the D diminished. Let's change the root, let's take an F minor 6. We've got one note from the C diminished and three notes from the D diminished, so this time we add the D flat diminished. This is where all four of these scales, the major 6th diminished, the minor 6th diminished, the dominant 7 diminished, and the dominant 7 flat 5 diminished come from. This is all very theoretical, however, once you get your head around this very logical concept, it will give you the ability to see all the relationships, and it gives you a good insight into how Barry came to the 6th diminished idea. Once you can visualize all these relationships and no longer need to think about the theory, it will be very liberating and you'll feel very free to add movement when improvising. The first thing we need to know when applying these scales is that Berry doesn't think in minor 7 chords. For example, if we see an A minor 7, it is really just a C6 with the 6th in the bass, as all the inversions of C6 are the same notes as A minor 7. This is the same for an A minor 7 flat 5 chord too, it is really just a C minor 6 with the 6th in the bass. You probably spotted this already when I was showing you some of the inversions of these chords. 
Barry adopted this way of thinking after he heard Thelonious Monk reference a minor 7 flat 5 chord in this way. So now, whenever we see a minor 7 chord, we think of it as just being an inversion of a major 6th chord, and when we see a minor 7 flat 5, it's just an inversion of a minor 6th chord. Another important rule to know is that every dominant chord has what Barry calls an important minor. The important minor is found on the 5th degree of the dominant, so if you had a D7, the important minor would be A minor 7. Uh, this is what we know as the 2-5 progression. However, as I said before, Berry thinks in movement and not static 2 5 ones. And remember, we don't think in minor 7 chords, so the 2 chord is actually a C6, and so we use the C major 6 diminished scale to create the movement which leads into the 5 chord. Here's a very basic way of what this can sound like. You could also continue this sound over the 5 chord, D7, as it creates a D7 sus sound plus the diminished movements. However, as we know, there are loads of other options which we can use for playing over the dominant 5 chord. So as well as using Barry's dominant 7th and dominant 7 flat 5 diminished scales for creating movement and harmonizing melodies over dominant chords, a good one to also know is that we can again use the important minor rule on D7, but this time think of the minor as an A minor 6, which allows us to use the A minor 6th diminished scale. Uh, the reason this works is for the same reason as before. Both D7 and A minor 6 come from the same C diminished chord. You just either lower the E flat to get to D7 or raise it to get to A minor 6. We can also use this same concept to get a different sound on the dominant chord by using the important minor rule on the tritone sub of D7. In other words, we can use the minor 6th diminished on the 5th degree of the A flat 7, which is the tritone sub of D7. This is what we call the tritones minor, so this would be using a E flat minor 6 diminished scale over D7, which creates the familiar sort of altered dominant sound. Now that you know where the tritones minor comes from, an easier way to achieve this sound is just to say you can use a minor 6 diminished scale a half step up from the dominant chord. And again, this works because the E flat minor 6 also comes from the same C diminished. It's also good to note that the makeup of a minor 6 diminished scale is great for creating harmonic movement as well as single note lines on melodic minor modes. So here's what the tritones minor can sound like for movement on the 5 chord. It's also important to note that when you're playing around with these ideas, you probably don't want to use the diminished to lead to the next chord. For example, in a 2-5-1, the movement between these chords already exist and work nicely. We're just using the diminished to create more movement which live within each chord. So we're using the major 6 diminished on the 2 chord to create its own dominant to tonic movement before voice leading from the 2 to the 5. As Barry thinks mainly in 6th chords, here are some important options which we need to know so that we can start to visualize which major and minor 6th chords can be used to create various types of harmony. So let's start with the important major types. If we have a C major chord, we know that our go-to is a C major 6. If we want to create a C major 9 sound, we can use a concept which Barry calls the 6th on the 5th. This is where we build a major 6th chord off of the 5th degree, so G major 6th over C, which gives us the notes of C major 9. This got mentioned earlier when I talked about connecting these two chords with the passing diminished. So let's check out our minor chord options. If we see a C minor 6, we know our go-to would just be to build a minor 6 off of the root, so giving us a C minor 6. If we see a C minor 7, we know that really it's just an inversion of E flat 6, so we would play a relative major 6 any time we saw a minor 7 chord. The same principle goes for a C minor 7 flat 5, as this is just an inversion of an E flat minor 6. So anytime we see a minor 7 flat 5 chord, we can think of the relative minor 6th chord. For the dominant chord options, let's start with a C7 sus4. If we wanted to create this sound, we would build a major 6th chord off of the 7th degree, so B flat major 6th over C. It's worth spotting the connection of B flat major 6th also being the option for a G minor 7, which is the important minor or the 2 chord of the C7. We can also create a C7 sus flat 9 sound by now using a B flat minor 6th built from the 7th degree. Our other two options are the ones I mentioned before, where we use the important minor rule and the tritone sub's important minor rule. So if we saw a C9, we would use a G minor 6 or a minor 6 built off the 5th degree, and for a C altered or a C7 sharp 5 flat 9 sound, we use the tritone's minor, the important minor of the tritone of C, or in other words, a minor 6 built off the flat 2, which is D flat minor 6 over C. So, because we can harmonize every note of the scale, this now allows us to harmonize melodies and provide movement under those melodies. 
You can apply this concept to any song, but using tunes from the American Songbook is a great resource to practice these ideas. Let's apply it to the song Stella by Starlight. This is a standard which Barry often uses to demonstrate these concepts because basically it works all over the place. Here's roughly how the tune goes. <laughs> So it's this section of the tune which we'll look at. So it's that bar with the static B-flat major chord and the descending scale as, a, as the melody. So this is a really great place to use the B-flat major 6th diminished scale because each one of these notes either come from the B-flat major 6th chord or the diminished chord. So if we look at each note and harmonize it, the E-flat, that comes from the diminished, D comes from the B-flat major 6th, C from the diminished, E-flat from the major 6th. So already just by harmonizing these notes, there's our movement. If we take this up the octave and continue through the tune, uh, we get something like this. I demonstrate another example but using the same scales you could get something like this Barry demonstrates a really cool counterpoint idea of this B flat major melody using the sixth diminished scale he harmonizes the descending melody as we've been doing, but in the bass or in his left hand, he adds a line which ascends through the scale. What makes this really interesting is that the harmonized descending melody starts on a diminished, the E flat. However, he starts the ascending bass movement on an F, which is from the major sixth. So you get both a diminished and a major sixth going against each other in contrary motion for each harmonized melody note. This creates some really interesting and tense sounds. It's hard to do on the guitar, but if you harmonize the melody in drop two like we've been doing, you can actually just leave out the bottom note and replace it with the ascending bass notes starting on F. So instead of something like this, we'd get this. This also actually voice leads perfectly into the flat five of the E half diminished. I'd probably break it up a little bit though when playing it on the guitar. So maybe something like this. idea for the F. Another fun thing you could experiment with is putting the melody in the bass and having the harmonized movement on top. So instead of playing the melody here, you could take it down an octave and now put the harmony on top of it. You just might want to play the harmony notes a little bit quieter than the melody notes so that the melody stands out. But yeah, you could get something like this. Here's a really cool move Barry talks about when explaining where half diminished chords can come from. Barry says a half diminished chord is just a minor chord with the sixth in the bass, and we can use that minor's relative major sixth diminished scale. So if we had F sharp minor 7 flat 5 or F sharp half diminished, Barry would say that it comes from C major because F sharp half diminished is just A minor with the 6th and the bass, and the relative major of A minor is C. Also look how these chords are a minor third apart. As we know, the family comes from minor third relationships. Barry uses this to create movement leading into the half diminished chord. The reason we can use C major 6th diminished to connect to the F sharp minor 7 flat 5 is because if we had a progression that went from the 1 to a minor 2 5 cadence to 3, or even 3 major, then in this key we would have C, F sharp minor 7 flat 5, B7, which would then resolve to either E minor or E major.
This is a very common progression which you'll find in so many tunes. So if we chose the individual 6th diminished scales for each one of those chords, we would use the C major 6th diminished for the C, A minor 6th diminished for the F sharp minor 7 flat 5, and C minor 6 for the B7. All of those 6th diminished scales use the same added diminished found on the major 7th degree of each of those scales, B diminished. So anytime you see a major chord moving to a minor 7 flat 5 a tritone away, you can use the major 6th diminished to get there, as there's only one note difference between the C6 and the F sharp minor 7 flat 5, or A minor 6 with the 6th in the bass. If we apply this theory to the first few chords of Stella by Starlight, the E half diminished could really be a B flat, because E half diminished is just G minor with the 6th in the bass, and B flat is the relative major of G minor. So we can actually play G minor 7 to C7 instead of the E half diminished to A7. C7 works in place of the A7 because they come from the same family and share the same diminished. So now if we look at the pattern of the first few chord changes, we get G minor 7 to C7, to C minor 7 to F7, to F minor 7 to B flat 7, which resolves to E flat major. This is really interesting to me because I always wondered how E half diminished to A7 to C minor was connected. But seeing these relationships has helped demystify that chord change. Another way to see how A7 to C minor connects is that we know A7 comes from B flat diminished, which is the same as D flat diminished, and D flat diminished to C minor is a really common chord change, which we see all the time. This is because D flat diminished voice leads or moves really nicely to C minor 7, as C minor 7 is really just E flat 6, which comes from D flat diminished by moving two consecutive notes. <laughs> Let's apply this half diminished concept to the section of the song we were looking at because it actually has this move in the chord sequence already. So it moves from B flat major to the E half diminished to A7, which then goes to D minor, which wants to move to the sixth in the bass, which then voice leads to the four minor of F, and then you can play F with A in the bass to voice lead more. It then goes to another E half diminished to A7, which then goes to A half diminished D7. So let's do what we did at the beginning of the song where we replace the E half diminished to A7 with a G minor 7 to C7 instead. Because this is then going to allow us to move to C minor 7 or E flat 6 instead of going straight to the A minor 7 flat 5. We want to do this because we want to use the E flat 6th diminished scale to get there, because as we know the A half diminished is really just a C minor with the 6th in the bass, and the relative major of C minor is E flat. So we could do something like this. Same kind of thing again. Barry also demonstrates being able to play an E flat major 7 chord with a B flat 7 to get in there, instead of going straight to the A half diminished. Let's do it with a tritone sub, so E7 instead of the B flat 7. This half diminished slash major relationship is a really nice one to understand because this can be applied to so many standards. This is just going to help us play more movement and disguise our common 2-5 progressions. A great example which Barry shows is on the song Night and Day. The chords are D half diminished to G7 to C major. But we know that really that D half diminished is just an F minor with a 6th in the bass and the relative major of F minor is A flat. So we can play A flat instead. A lot of people play this chord already for this tune, but how about creating movement between the two by using the A flat major 6th diminished scale? The tune then goes from the C major 7 chord to an F sharp half diminished. Well, we don't really want to just jump from C to F sharp. 
we want to play movement and connect the two. So relative minor of C is A minor, put the sixth in the bass, we've got F sharp minor seven flat five. So we know that this chord just comes from C major and then we can play a movement like this. We could also choose to go through an entire song harmonizing every note of the melody using the sixth diminished scale. For example, if we apply it to the first bit of the melody on the song There'll Never Be Another You, which is in the key of E flat, we would use the E flat major sixth diminished scale. If I do it up the octave, So this works, however, in my opinion, I'm not always too keen on the sound of playing these big boxed chords while trying to bring out a melody on the guitar. There's still movement happening and it can be really nice in the right moment, however, sometimes less is more and there are more subtle ways that we could apply this scale to complement the inner movements while still having the melody stand out. This concept is great for voice leading and creating interesting counterpoint lines, but in order to have some real control over the harmonic possibilities and movement, we need to practice it the same way as we would practice any other scale. As well as practicing the scale as chords with the different drop voicings and inversions, Barry also gets his students to practice the scale in other ways. Here are a few common ways to practice the scale to get you started with applying different ideas into your improvising. I'll demonstrate these exercises in the key of C using the C major 6th diminished scale. However, you should also practice all these ideas for the minor 6th, dominant 7 and dominant 7 flat 5 diminished scales too. And of course in all 12 keys so that you can freely apply the ideas over any set of chords. So, just like any other scale, we need to be able to play it with different interval sets. Here it is in thirds. So it's good to spot that one of these thirds is actually a major second interval, the between the G and the A. However, in this context, that major second is actually acting as a type of third. Six are also a really good one to know, especially for playing melodies. In octaves. Yeah, on guitar, practicing that one without changing position is really good fingering and visualization practice. Another useful set for melodies is learning the scale in tenths. Barry also gets his students to practice this scale in contrary motion. It's a bit tricky on the guitar, but it's great for independence, and you can use it for some really interesting movement within your lines. And of course we want to practice all this stuff for all four scales. So for example, let's make this minor. So in order for us to be able to freely do this on any part of the neck, and so that we can practice different note combinations, we should try starting it from each scale degree. So for example, I can move up the neck and practice this contrary scale starting on the second degree. Or we could move down, let's start it on the 6th. Just have fun and experiment doing this everywhere on the neck. What's really good is adding some polyrhythmic practice while playing these scales in contrary motion. So for example, we could play the ascending line in standard quarter notes and then maybe the descending line could be dotted quarter notes. Flip it around, so now the ascending note's doing the dotted quarter note. Try and finger it so that every note lasts their actual note value as well. You could even try and combine this counterpoint idea with the interval sets from earlier. For example, we could move down the scale in six, but also with a contrary bass movement. Swap the direction. Mm. 
Barry also likes to practice gradually filling in the notes from the corresponding chord when playing the scale in contrary motion. So as his right hand ascends through the scale and his left hand descends, a note gets added for each degree which creates an expanding effect which makes the sound of the scale get bigger and bigger. Also by playing it backwards it will then create a contracting effect making the sound go from big to small. So this is of course impossible to play on the guitar, however there's loads of other ways we can voice each degree in order to create the same kind of effect. Just remember the most important thing is to keep the soprano note and the bass note moving in contrary motion and then to just fill in the notes from the corresponding chord gradually, changing from three note voicings to four note voicings when you can. The way I like to do it is like this. This is a good one because even though we aren't adding an extra note each time, when we get to the four note voicings, we go from a drop two to a drop three and then to a drop two and four. And because these voicings are naturally more spread out each time, it helps create that expanding or bigger effect. Barry likes to use segments of this idea in loads of different ways when he's improvising lines. When practicing different keys, he often applies it to a recurring two five progression which change key down a tone each time. Another common example he teaches is a move which he does as a sort of response with his left hand. It doesn't necessarily have the strict contrary motion, but it does use the idea of gradually adding more and more notes. So the idea is he does a jump from the root to the fifth, and then he goes up the scale up until the third, while adding extra notes and expanding. So it sounds like this. One note, one note, one note, two notes, two notes, three notes, three notes, four notes. So in context, you could do something like this. Let's say we wanted to do this move on the two chord, and let's make this two chord half diminished. So for D half diminished, we would think F minor six and do the same move. You can really take this idea and voice it with any added notes, or you can even try different starting points. Just experiment and find what you like. But the main thing which all of this is going to hopefully open up is the ability to create some interesting lines with real movement and to get us away from thinking that we always need to play these big harmonized block chords all the time. Here's another one Barry likes to do which is actually really well suited for guitar. He moves up from the diminished to the C6 and then descends through the scale with that same pattern. But what's really interesting about it is that for the diminished he only plays two notes, which then expands to three notes for the C6. This naturally creates beautiful inner movement and a counterpoint type line. Here's what it sounds like. You could even play it more in position. Or the minor version. Let's try it in a 2-5, so C6 diminished for A minor 7, and then we'll play the pattern in E flat minor 6 diminished for the 5 chord D7. There are some other things which we can do to help break up playing each block chord. For example, for each diminished chord, we could just play the bass note. So instead of playing everything, we'd just get this. This creates a much more fluid sound which complements the movement, and it's also a lot easier to play at higher speeds. But let's say you do want to hear the full sound of the diminished voicing, so let's condense down the C6 instead. Let's play the C6 chords in tenths, eliminating the alto and tenor voice. Or we could do tenths and full chords for both. We can also take this idea further and practice connecting chords with the scale and the bass, so using a bass line as the movement. We can also descend.
So we also want to practice the scale in a way where we can improvise single note lines. And again, we tackle this the same as any other scale, so starting by getting comfortable playing it up and down with a nice fingering. And then we can play it in thirds. Remember, G to A is a third. And of course, when we practice groupings like this, we should try all the variations too, so like this one. Or this is a good one too. The next thing would be practicing the triads. Barry likes to repeat a note so that it rhythmically fits. Back down. Here's a really musical descending triad pattern which is worth practicing. It's sort of a triad pivot move where you start in the fifth and then jump below to play the root in the third before repeating the fifth again. Here's how it sounds. This one sounds really great for minor actually. Next we practice four note chords. Descending. And again, this one sounds great for minor. So, all of these ideas should help us create lines when using this scale to improvise. For example, as we know, the 6th diminished scale has the sound of a perfect cadence already built into it, so it can work very well over our 2-5-1 progressions. Let's try using some of those nice minor ideas over a minor 2-5, something like this. Okay, so now let's talk about borrowing. This is a really important concept within the sixth diminished scale, which is going to truly open up endless harmonic possibilities and choices when playing movement. So what is the borrowing concept? As we know, the major sixth diminished only has two chords, a major sixth and a diminished chord. And the scale comes from putting the notes of these two chords together. So borrowing is taking one or more notes from one of the chords and playing it within the other. The example Barry will often show first is taking a C6 chord and replacing the 6 with a borrowed diminished note from above, giving us a new chord with the notes C, E, G, and B. So we may know this chord as a C major 7, however in Barry's way of thinking, this is actually a C6 chord with a borrowed diminished note. And it's going to be best for us to think of it like this too when we're using this whole Barry Harris concept. So what he then gets his students to do is run that new chord up the 6th diminished scale. So the second chord would now be a diminished with a borrowed 6th note, and it would continue with that pattern as you went up the scale. And if you did want to give conventional names to each one of these new chords, then we would technically get a C major 7, D minor 7 flat 5, E minor 11, F diminished major 7, G7 sus, A flat diminished major 7, A minor major 7, and B minor 7 flat 5. So this has now given us some really interesting and more modern sounding chords to harmonize with. The next thing to experiment with would be to try and borrow other notes to generate more new sounds. For example, borrowing a diminished note from above or below the root of the C6 chord, or the third or the fifth. And then we would take these new voicings through the scale. You could also borrow two diminished notes, such as one replacing the sixth and one replacing the fifth, and then take that through the scale, or borrow one from below and one from above. When taking these new voicings through the scale, a lot of the chords you'll generate will be hard to give a conventional name to. However, it doesn't really matter because we know it's just a major sixth chord with X amount of borrowed diminished notes, or vice versa. The true key to borrowing is being able to visualize the diminished notes which surround each sixth note. So on the guitar and drop two, here's our C6. Now with the borrowed diminished note, and then let's take this through the scale. So even with this, we can use this as a sort of suspended movement for each chord. So the diminished note is resolving to the major sixth note. Add some chromatics for even more movement. Mm. 
also try it on different string sets. Now let's change the borrowed note from being in the alto voice to the soprano voice. There's some really great stuff to discover here, so make sure to also practice this idea for all the other types of drop voicings, and of course in all 12 keys. These borrowed sounds also work great for harmonizing melodies too. For example, if I take the tune we looked at earlier, There Will Never Be Another You, and do something like this. As you can hear, by experimenting with all this, we've managed to get some really modern sounds which has all just come from this traditional sixth diminished concept. Here's a nice berry example for a 2-5 and G, so A-7 to D7. The movement is going to happen on the 2 chord leading into the 5 chord, and our melody is going to be this. Okay, so we know that the 2 chord, A-7, is really just a C major 6th, and we can use the C major 6th diminished scale, which does work perfectly to harmonize this melody, and also voice leads really nicely into the D7. So that starting A-7, or C6, already has a borrowed diminished note because of the melody, the B. But in order for the other notes to accurately move through the scale in the same way as the melody does, we need to set up our starting chord with more borrowed diminished notes. Let's borrow another diminished note for the bass, replacing the G to a G sharp. So this is now our starting chord, which supports the first note of the melody. And with this, the bass voice can now share the same melodic shape as the melody as they can now move perfectly through the scale together. Because before, when the bass voice was a G, and when we jumped to this block voicing to harmonize the next melody note, the bass voice had to skip a note of the scale, which doesn't copy the same melodic shape as the melody in the same way that G sharp does. Let's now add a third borrowed diminished note by changing the E to an F. And now let's move these three diminished notes through the scale to harmonize the melody. As you can see, these three notes can move perfectly through the scale together, giving them the same melodic shape. This sounds really great, and even though if you look at the harmonized notes, it's just the same as the original harmonized C6 diminished version, but with the tenor voice missing. However, to me it sounds so much better because those three notes are set up perfectly to move through the scale, and then voice lead to the D7. And so the specific notes all have a purpose which was set up by the starting A minor 7 or C6 chord with the necessary borrowed diminished notes. This has helped achieve a much more sophisticated note choice rather than just playing the go-to block voicings to harmonize the melody. Let's apply the same kind of movement for the 5 chord. So we know for D7, we can use the E flat minor 6 diminished. And if we copy the melody idea, we get this. So again, we now have an E flat minor 6 chord with a borrowed diminished note the F. And this is already interesting because this is a very common D altered move which people do to lead to a G major. But what we probably don't think about is that it comes from borrowing a note from the diminished. So why not borrow more? Or... But going back to the melody, let's now add the second borrowed diminished to the first chord and move it through the scale. Now let's borrow the third one. Put the two and the five together. So that's some really nice movement. Let's try another example, but change key to a two five in C major. So for D minor seven, we use F major six diminished, and let's do something different for the five chord. Let's use notes from the half whole diminished scale. Here's the idea. So what I did there was I went up the F major 6 diminished, but skipping a diminished inversion just for a melodic choice. Skip. I then skipped again to an F6 chord with a borrowed diminished note. Again, just for the purpose of the melody. I then went up to the diminished. And then before resolving to the 5 chord, I played an F6 again, but the one with the three borrowed diminished notes. This gives a whole new tension which allows me to gradually voice lead to the 5 chord. 
So the bass and alto voice resolve first. Wow, the, I let the E hang, which is nice to do. But I resolve the E before going to the five. And then for the five chord, I did this pattern. What this is, is using the diminished scale for the dominant tension. If you remember earlier, I mentioned that the eight note diminished scale was made up of two diminished chords. In this case, an A flat diminished and also the diminished, which is made up of the four related dominant roots that come from the A flat diminished. So G diminished. So when played over G7, this gives us a half whole diminished scale. In the same way that F major 6 diminished only has two chords which we've been borrowing between, I can do this same borrowing concept to the two diminished chords which make up this half whole scale. So that five chord line is really just an A flat diminished with a borrowed note from G diminished, which I resolve. I then just move this through its inversions, which happens to all be the same as it's only using diminished chords, which are of course all symmetrical. And you can borrow between these two diminished chords for any chord tone too. So, as you can hear, there is so much we can do to provide different movements between these chords, because we're not just moving from a subdominant to a dominant to a tonic, or in other words, playing a 2-5-1. These concepts allow us to create movement within each chord, like what we've been doing on the 2 chord. This is because the scale creates its own inner subdominant to dominant relationships within this 2 chord. So, we know the 2-5-1 is found everywhere in music, but this 6th diminished scale is showing us where it's found within each chord. So by seeing these inner relationships, this is what's going to allow us to break free from just being 2-5 players, and instead musicians who play movements. So, the short and long voicings are basically a technique which produces a really beautiful and easy way to get movement on a static chord. Let's apply this to C6. So to generate what Berry calls a short voicing, you start with a closed root position C6, and then you proceed it with a closed position G6 from above. This G6 happens to be in its second inversion. This ties in with our sixth on the fifth, sixth chord option from earlier, where we said that a G6 over C gives you a C major nine sound. So now what we do with this is we move that pattern through the scale. However, Berry doesn't include the flat six in this scale, so we're essentially just taking it through the C major scale. What you'll notice is for each G6 to C6 cell, the two inner voices, the alto and tenor, stay the same, and the two outer voices, the soprano and bass, move. This is what we get. So, when we deconstruct what's happening here, the inner voices are giving us these thirds, which move up the scale for each cell and the outer voices are giving us a major sixth interval which is doing this pattern. Okay, so for what Berry calls the long voicing, what we do is take the same G6 to C6 cell which we started with, but we flip the outer voices. So the top note goes down an octave and the bottom note goes up an octave. Middle notes stay the same. By doing this, it actually generates drop two voicings. And like before, we take this pattern through the scale. So that's our long voicing. We still have the thirds moving in the middle, but now the outer voices are moving in tenths. It may help if we give these generated chords a conventional name, but only for the purpose of learning the voicings. We shouldn't necessarily think about this in block chords, otherwise it takes away the aspect of this being all about movement. So what we can now do is combine both of these voicings into short long or long short. This is where some really pretty movement starts to happen. Here's what I mean. For short long, we would play the first short voice G6 to C6 cell and then follow it with the first long voice cell. And doing that through the scale would then sound like this. So this creates a really nice scale down movement in the bass. And on top we get this nice melody. So together.
For long short, we would do the same thing, but just change the order to the long voice first and then the short voice, which sounds like this. So now we have the descending scale movement on top and the nice melody in the bass. I believe Barry actually plays these movements by only hitting the middle voices once within a cell. This makes it much smoother and it's better for speed on the piano. These systems actually work really nicely on the piano and the fingerings are quite easy but really satisfying to play. However, this isn't something that necessarily works or comes across well on the guitar. There are a few things we need to work around because even though the long voicings are in drop two which work really well on the guitar, it can be a real struggle to play the closed position short voicings or even impossible if using any other string set other than the top four. So here's a tip for what we can do on the guitar in order to achieve this concept more easily and with more control. So our options are to either leave out the alto voice or the tenor voice on the short voicings so that it eliminates any nasty stretches. And it's up to you if you want to continue leaving out the chosen voice when switching to the long voicing so it's consistent. I don't actually mind playing the full voicing as long as it doesn't interfere with the flow of the music, however you should definitely practice both. So here's what short long sounds like without the alto and the short voicings. Now here's what it sounds like without the tenor voice instead, but I'll do it long short this time. There's also a cool demonstration of Barry practicing this, but also including key changes as well. He starts in C and then does a key change up a minor third, which sounds really great. Barry likes to practice in different keys by often finding a creative and musical way to change key up a minor third. For example, he'll do this pattern when moving through a scale as chords. He'll play the 1, the 2 and the 3, and then he'll move up a half step to play the 2 chord of the key a minor third above. He'll then move down to the 1 of the new key and start that pattern again until he's moved through all four keys. This is cool because remember the family is based off of minor third relationships, so this is practicing the brother and sister keys within that family. You're also going to want to practice this system for minor as well, so to generate a C minor sound, just flatten the third so every E becomes E flat. Let's again use the important minor rule to apply it on a dominant chord. So on a 2-5 in G, let's use the C6 for A minor 7, and then E flat minor 6, the tritones minor for D7. Let's get rid of the outer voice to make it a bit easier. There is another thing which I've experimented with, with this short and long concept, which is starting with the different inversions of C6 and then moving through the scale with those new starting points. 
It's generated the same way, so the short voicing starts with a closed position C6 chord, but this time in either first, second, or third inversion. And we then proceed it with the G6 chord from above. So if it was a first inversion C6 with E in the bass, you would proceed it with a closed voice G6 in third inversion with E in the bass and so on. And then again, to generate the long voicing, you would just flip the top and bottom note. However, these sounds don't work as well as the original because the voices which move in each cell to create the melodies are now in the inner part of the voicing, and the notes which stay the same are now on the outer part of the chord. So you don't really hear the movement as clearly. However, I did check them out, so I thought it was worth sharing. The final thing I experimented with was including the flat 6 in the scale when moving the G6 to C6 cell through it. This generated some really interesting sounds, have a listen. This is just an insight to one of Barry Harris's concepts as he has loads more amazing views on music and methods to learning the jazz language. And what's really beautiful is that they all tie in together. So I hope you found this video useful. Please feel free to comment if you have any more thoughts on any of these ideas. Practicing this concept is a never ending journey. So if you have anything to add, I'd love to hear it. If this is all new to you, then I encourage you to experiment with this stuff and to develop your own ways of applying these sounds. And of course, go check out Barry Harris so that you can learn straight from the source. So I thought I'd finish the video with a loose improvised example of using some of these ideas over one of my favorite standards, Autumn in New York. But yeah, if you found this video useful, please go ahead and like, subscribe and share the video. And also remember to hit the notification bell if you don't want to miss out on any future videos and lessons. Huge thanks for watching and I'll see you guys in the next one. Cheers.